So um, let's go ahead and get started. Hello and welcome to MIT, um, either in person or online, for our annual Aging Brain Initiative Symposium. I am Li Wei Tsai, Director of the Picard Institute for Learning and Memory. I'm so delighted to have you join us. So aging is a biological phenomenon that has fascinated many of us, yet we still don't completely understand the mechanism underlying the process of aging. We do know that aging is associated with many health problems, particularly the chronic and progressive um, diseases of the brain, known as neurodegenerative diseases. So at MIT, we've sought to encourage new thinking for the aging brain. In 2015, I and several other colleagues founded the Aging Brain Initiative to catalyze a community of innovation within MIT with a broad perspective about the many complex dimensions of the problem of neurodegeneration. It is a whole systems breakdown that will require innovation, not just in neuroscience, but also technology, finance, and even policy to fully tackle. Last year, we put out a, a campus-wide call for innovative new ideas and awarded C grants to help a selection of these ideas get underway. I should note that the Aging Brain Initiative is philanthropically funded, and it is my honor to thank the many generous donors who sustain these programs. Today, we will hear from several of the primary investigators um, who we selected for awards, including professors uh, Peter Didan, uh, Richard Raman, Thomas Hout, and Institute Professor Angre Bill. We are excited to feature a keynote presentation uh, by Professor Mike Nidegard from University of Rochester. Her discoveries about the glymphatic system in the brain have had a tremendous influence on research um, in um, many, many different laboratories worldwide, and um, including my own laboratory. So for those of, those of us here in person, after closing remarks, we will get a chance to learn about even more innovative research as about 30 trainees from a dozen MIT and partner institution labs present posters on their latest work. Finally, before we start our program, I would like to thank Dr. Emily Niederrest, Director of Scientific Initiative at the Picard Institute, who put the program together and Brittany Greenow, our um, wonderful event coordinator. This event would not be possible without their tireless work. So please let us give them a round of applause. <laughs> so um, now it is my pleasure to um, invite uh, Professor Peter Didon, a uh, Singapore professor of biological engineering, um, to present his work uh, titled The tRNA uh, Epitranscriptome Translational Deregulation and Neurodegenerative Diseases. Please. Thank you very much. Can you hear that OK? I'll put my teacher's voice on here. Well, I want to thank the organizers today for doing this. This is wonderful. It's my first foray into uh, neurobiology. I want to thank the funders for the pilot awards for the very generous award. It's a real honor to be able to do this. And I want to tell a good story now. It's a progress report. Rather than a complete story, it's only been a year, but we've had a lot of fun digging in here. Have to do the disclosures to say that some of the things we talk about are in the realm of uh, patents and uh, companies that I've started with my colleague, Tom Bagley. Uh, as Li Wei mentioned, I'm in the Singapore MIT Alliance for Research and Technology. I've been a member of this program for about 15 years. Uh, I have a group there. I'll be there in about two weeks for three weeks. Uh, my MIT group, though, is where I've been doing the work on this particular pilot study. And the two people in green boxes over there, Guang Shun Sun on the right and uh, Rui Shi Chen on the left, are really the people who've done all the work today that I want to talk about. 
So this work represents a collaboration with Ben Wollitson, which I think, whom I think some of you may know over at Boston University, a neurobiologist, a former scientist in his lab, uh, Lulu Jang, who's now a faculty member at University of Virginia, really looking at a mouse model of a neurodegenerative disease, the tauopathies. Uh, very, I think it's a very well-established mouse model. Everybody knows this one. And we're going to look now at the role of the epitranscriptome and translational dysregulation involved in this pathobiology. So this is where my lab goes back to its roots. I've been at MIT for 32 years, everything nucleic acids. We used to do a lot of DNA damage work. We're circling back to that again. A lot of epigenetics now with the DNA and histone modifications that regulate transcription. And more recently even, the epitranscriptome with 170 different chemical modifications of RNA that regulate translation. So if you look at the genome as a parts list, it's the epigenomes and the epitranscriptomes that really schedule the when and why and how much of gene expression that happens. And you'll see examples of that today. I'm going to focus on the epitranscriptome here uh, as a bit of eye candy. I'm a biochemist, so I love chemical structures. This is 150 different modified ribonucleosides from the Modomics website. It's 170 now that are known, and these decorate all forms of RNA. Humans have about 50. Nobody knows for certain yet. Nobody's done the uh, get out from under the light of the lamppost to look for keys way out there in the wilds. Uh, mice have about the same, all mammals have roughly the same number. Uh, they're in all forms of RNA, coding, non-coding, every form has some sort of modification. MicroRNAs have a 2 prime O methyl group at the 3 prime end and possibly other modifications. We don't know all of them yet because we haven't been able to isolate enough pure forms of RNA to truly validate the presence of these things. You need a sequencing technology to prove that a modification is in a specific sequence. We like uh, transfer RNAs because it's stupid easy. There's so many modifications in the transfer RNAs, 70 to 90 nucleotides long, 10% of the nucleotides are something other than A, G, C, and U. And they're in the map on the left, sort of a conserved uh, diagram of where many of the conserved modifications are located in a generic tRNA. Uh, what's really wonderful about this from a computational or informatic perspective, humans express about 250 of their 500 tRNA genes. And you've got 10% of 50 possible combinations in that. You have a huge information content. And as I'll show you a little bit later, the patterns of the tRNA modifications that we can quantify are about 90% predictive of the stress the cell is enduring. You'll see why that is the case in a minute lots of connections to disease that I want to highlight today. So Tom Bagley uh, was a postdoc here many years ago, left to start a faculty position, told a story of how tRNAs regulate translation in st chemical stress response. I was on his advisory board for his uh, transitional grant, heard his first presentation, resigned from the advisory board, and immediately became a collaborator. We are joined at the hip <laughs> for 15 years now. We've been working on this uh, uh, particular project dozens of grants, hundreds of papers, uh, all pointing to this model. And in this model, we, we discovered this by doing a bunch of omic technologies to look for patterns that form during translation. In this model, a stress hits a cell. The pool of uh, 50 uh, tRNAs, if it's a simple eukaryote, or 250 tRNAs, if it's a mammalian cell, reprograms in terms of the number of copies of each tRNA and in terms of the modifications that decorate that tRNA, especially at the wobble position of the tRNA that reads the wobble position of the anticodon. Those reprogrammed tRNAs then, for better or worse, read their uh, cognate codons, and we'll just say in this case, better. What Tom Bagley then discovered was families of genes needed to respond to that stress have unique enrichments of synonymous codons. You'll see in a minute, I mean, 20 amino acids, 61 codons, you've got redundant codons. They're synonymous. They're not randomly used in the genome. This is a fallacy of the uh, 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 lack of information. Now, Tom, we're just about to publish a paper to show that in yeast, these synonymous codon biases predict specific go response categories for cellular responses. So what happens is the stress uniquely reprograms the tRNAs that then uniquely read their, their codons. Those codons are enriched in all the genes you need to respond to that stress. 
So it's kind of a just-in-time translation factory to get the proteins you need to survive or adapt or change at that moment. Okay, so it, it sounds grand, right? We've now shown it in, started in uh, yeast and bacteria. We've got some work in rats. I'll talk about some human stuff today. Even viruses, we've got a paper out now showing how dengue virus, which, whose RNA genome has co got completely the opposite code on usage pattern of humans, has to hijack the human translational system and change the tRNA pool to get it to read the codons in its genome and replicate and survive. So all forms of life use this particular system. I want to tell a story as background. It's an old story. It's 2016. Uh, my first grad student in Singapore, Yo Kian Chun, uh, but it's a complete story. He's a polymath who did all the studies uh, that take normally three or four postdocs to do. And it's a story of how tuberculosis bacteria survive hypoxia. We wanted to know how does translational regulation function in turning TB into its dormant state. You breathe in the bacillus. It gets engulfed by a macrophage. The TB bacteria stops the macrophage from killing it. It essentially sets up a program to then go to sleep. The macrophage gets walled off in a granuloma, no blood, no oxygen. How does the bug survive? It essentially shuts down into the state of dormancy. And then maybe 10, 20, 30 years later, it can break out and you have an even more lethal infection than you did the first time. So this is tuberculosis and we wanted to know how does this tRNA reprogramming work in that case. So at the time, nobody knew the modifications in any bug other than E. coli. And so Yokian established the identities of 40 modifications. Now it turns out 70% are shared by everybody. So it's easy to figure out the, the easy ones, the hard ones are hard. You have to do uh, uh, mass spec and classic structural chemistry to figure them out. He did that. He then has a, this is a, a HPLC chromatogram and the signal intensity on the mass spec. You can see the 40 that he measured. It's a beautiful array. Okay. So to study hypoxia, we didn't use TB. We used a slow-growing relative, Mycobacterium bovis. You screw the lid shut. No more oxygen. The bugs slowly stop dividing as they use up the oxygen. They're not dead. That's colony-forming units. They just go to sleep. Then at about 18 days, after about three, four weeks, you can open the lid. They re-aerate, and boom, they start growing again. So it's a shelf reagent. This is the classic model for hypoxic dormancy. What uh, Yokan did was to sample at a bunch of different time points, measure all those modifications by mass spec, and then we did a self-organizing hierarchical clustering here, a heat map. The columns are the days of hypoxia. The rows are the modifications he measured. And right away, you see patterns. Red is high compared to a row average. Green is low. Oxic conditions have a unique pattern. The four boxes that I put on there actually are the histological microbiological stages of hypoxic dormancy that were defined 50 years ago. The tRNA modifications are just re tell replicating that behavior. Now, each of them is unique, and I said they're about 80 to 90 percent predictive. So what, what the students and postdocs always do then is pick a state and pick a modification and go do deep diving. So Yokan picked CMO5U, carboxymethyloxyuridine, which is a modification in most bacteria and showed using mass spec that it's present on at least this tRNA for threonine. Threonine's got three tRNAs and four codons. And Yokan then showed that when hypoxia hit, 100% of the U's went from MO5U to CMO5U through the action of a specific set of enzymes. Okay, cool. So this threonine now gets completely reprogrammed then he asks, all right, which genes in that organism, sorry, did I miss one there? I did, I, I, I apologize, I forgot to tell you. That uh, tRNA with UGU reads the ACG codon. Now we ask, all right, which genes have an ACG codon in them? This is where Tom Bagley developed a codon counting algorithm. Columns are one of the 64 codons. The rows are the genes, and this is in uh, mycobacteria with about 5,000 genes, uh, 4,000 genes. You see red colored blobs and yellow colored blobs. Those are genes that overuse and underuse specific codons, and they form a group, two groups actually, in this uh, mycobacterium. The top group 
happens to be all the genes you need to go to sleep. The DOS regulon gets activated in early hypoxia. The DOS R transcription factor dramatically overuses ACG codon. That's the one that got reprogrammed. And that compares to the genome average and dramatically underuses the optimal codon, the most abundant codon in the genome for threonine ACC. All the other genes then also have codon biases that match the tRNAs and the modifications. So that would predict that the tRNA with its modification is going to selectively read ACG enriched uh, uh, messenger RNAs and that those then are going to be stress response proteins. So he then went and did TMT or ITRAC proteomics in this case, sampling at the same time points to ask what proteins are up and what proteins are down. Long story short, if we do a principal component analysis and we look at the uh, loadings plot here, the blue box is the region where is in the region of the upregulated proteins. The yellow box, the region of the downregulated proteins. What you see are codons highly enriched in the upregulated proteins and codons highly enriched in the genes for the downregulated proteins at each time point. The arrows are connecting synonymous codons. When lysine AAA is present in the gene for an upregulated protein at whatever time point, the downregulated proteins way overused the synonymous partner AAG. So this showed alternative genetic information in the form of synonymous codons. I want to turn a gene on, all right? Put a codon in there and overuse it. But at the same time, I want to turn another gene off, put its synonymous partner in and enrich it, and you'll get automatic selective increases or decreases of proteins, all based on the pool reprogramming under the stress to make the proteins. So this is a, a beautiful model. How do we know it works in humans? Well, we published a bunch of papers, and if you believe that stuff. Uh, the most dramatic examples, though, are in cancer. So in this case, there's quite a few cancer subtypes of glioblastoma, sarcoma, uh, acute myelogenous leukemia that amplify gene copy number for metal one. Metal one puts a methyl group at position 47 on a guanine at the N7 position. I love the biochemistry, all right? And it does this in 12 of 250 expressed tRNAs. Turns out the codons on those 12 are enriched in oncogenes, cell cycle control genes. So when you have too much of the M7G, the tRNA population goes way up. You inappropriately translate messenger RNAs that shouldn't get translated at that moment, and you hypertranslate things that cause the cell to grow. Now, if you knock metal one out, the tumor stops growing. That was the basis for a company we started to make anti-cancer drugs that inhibit these RNA modifying enzymes. So very powerful mechanisms operant, at least in human disease. OK. So here we are. Let's now focus on neurobiology, neurodegeneration. And this is where we're very thankful for uh, getting this grant to do this. Everybody knows these are, this, is, this is my 101 for neurodegeneration, right? What are the hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease? Pete, what's the quiz here? Let's go. Uh, beta amyloid plaques, neurofibrillary tangles, inflammation, neurodegeneration. I got my start here at MIT on inflammation chemistry. That's pig's breakfast of innate immune system reactions that happens to destroy uh, things and cause cancer by making mutations. Well, all right, so in many cases, you can pinpoint mutations in the beta amyloid gene and in the tau protein gene that lead them to precipitate and make these pathologies, right? But that's not the entire explanation for the diseases associated with it. What are the other mechanisms? Well, here we come. Maybe we have some new ideas here to, to share. Uh, they're, they're protein precipitation diseases. How do you precipitate a protein? Well, maybe you translate it too fast and it doesn't fold properly. How do you translate too fast? Synonymous codons control the rate of translation. This has been well known for years that if we substitute different rare codons, we can pause translation to allow protein folding to happen with chaperones and then let it go forward. Well, is part of the problem here that we have some silent mutations? that don't change the amino acid, but change translation rate. Don't know, just throwing these out, lots of fun. Um, are there mutations 
that uh, dysregulate the translational machinery, these tRNA modifying enzymes. Are any of those known to be associated? Well, I didn't go do a GWAS study uh, for all the potential mutations across people with Alzheimer's and the like, but here we are now trying to see if these tRNA epitranscriptome codon bias translation have anything to do with what's going on. All right, so here come Ben and Lulu when we're using the uh, tau map t uh, mutant expression system in the mouse that has about a five-fold overexpression of the human mutant compared to the endogenous. It takes about nine to 12 months to get the really overt pathology to develop. And now we're going to test this with our system. OK, how did we do the experiments? Well, we took brain hemisections. We're going to get to the point where we micro dissect different brain regions. We now have the sensitivity to be able to do that for tiny amounts of the protein. So we get the RNA. Uh, the proteins, and now we're going to look at the three sections of our system, modifications, tRNA levels, and proteomics, and see if we can't find evidence for any of this mechanism. So uh, Guangxin took uh, a lot of samples of tRNA and did exactly what Yokian did earlier. The uh, columns are the uh, ages of the, of the mice as well as their pathology. Do they have the mutant or the wild type, if you will, P301S expression? And the rows then are all the modifications. Blue is down, red is up relative to a row average. OK, bingo. Right away, you see age-dependent changes. Now, how do you factor out age-dependent changes from pathology-dependent changes? Well, look at nine months. There's some very serious reds and blues that are independent of the age and probably then are pathology-specific changes in the program here. OK. Let's kind of, now, now the fun starts. Now you roll up your sleeves and play biochemical detective when you do this kind of omic science. Some of the modifications are in ribosomal RNAs as well as tRNA. And when you isolate RNA, ribosomal RNA can degrade. What if that degradation is a part of the pathology and you get little bits of ribosomal RNA co-purifying with the tRNA? It might tell you something important. It might also tell you that you just did crappy RNA isolation, which happens all the time. And this is one of the reasons we don't study RNA from dead people. You can't. It's, I'm sorry, it's totally degraded for everything. Even messenger RNA profiling is unreliable because of the uncontrolled degradation. So we have switched completely to the mouse models. All right, do these things tell us anything? Well, we don't know yet. We have to sequence the pieces in order to verify their source and the location of the modification. But there are some things that do happen here. It turns out that some of these highly upregulated modifications, these are the two O methyl ribonucleosides, AM, GM, CM, and UM, but UM actually went down here. Well, it turns out AM is a modification at position four put in by an enzyme called TRIM-T, tRNA methyltransferase 13. Spoiler alert, that one goes way up in the pathology of tauopathy, all right? So we put this 2-O-methyl modification right there at position 4 in your garden variety tRNA. And we can now go look to see, sequence the RNAs, and locate that, as well as look at the modification. So we have some clues already for some interesting things going on. OK, here's another one. MS2I6A, and I apologize for not putting the chemical structure up there. Uh, th this is an adenosine with this long isopentineal group and then a sulfur hanging off the ring. That one goes way up in pathology-dependent nine-month-old mice. Turns out we know something about MS2 I6A in yeast, not so much in humans. It looks like it could read a bunch of mitochondrial tRNA codons. People haven't looked in humans. Everybody in the literature says this is only happens in mitochondria. Uh, you can't say that unless you've looked and people haven't looked. So we're going to start looking at all the tRNAs in the humans, cytosolic and mitochondrial. The prediction here is, why did that MS2I6A go up in the tRNA fraction? Either a bunch of unmodified tRNAs got modified, or a bunch of tRNAs that are modified increased in copy number. We can investigate that. And that's what we might predict, is that the codons for these MS2 I6A dependent tRNAs are enriched in genes that got upregulated in terms of translation in the pathology. Don't know yet. I don't have a spoiler for you on that one. 
Keosine. Keosine is one of my favorite, and I want to talk about this at the end, uh, because there's a cool connection between microbiome, epitranscriptome, and neurodegenerative disease. It's very amazing. Q for us goes skyrocketing when you have reactive oxygen species hitting a cell. But it went way down in the nine-month-old mice. Now, what does that mean? Is the inflammation taking place in these animals not the type of inflammation that's associated with reactive oxygen species? Is it more of a T-cell mediated inflammation? I don't know. Uh, you ought to, uh, it, it shouldn't go down if there's lots of ROS. That, that is a conundrum for us. We have to figure that one out. Uh, but that's called job security for old professors when you don't have all the answers right away. Okay, there's the tRNA pool. We've looked at that now. That's beautiful rock solid data. Uh, you know, six, seven, eight, nine samples in each replicate. Very beautiful numbers. Now we want to look at this proteome part of this. So we've got the, at least the modifications. We don't have the tRNAs yet. Let's go look to see, if, is there codon bias translation happening? And this is where we're collaborating with Andrew uh, Emily, who used to be at BU. Now he's over at Oregon State. And his uh, postdoc, Wei Wei Lin, who still is at BU, along with Ben, they did beautiful deep proteomics analyses now Got about 9,000 proteins uh, 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 done. The GO analyses tell you what you might expect. There's an upregulation of proteins associated with neurodegenerative disease and Alzheimer's. So the, the quality control on this looks good. What we wanted to do then was pick the most upregulated and downregulated proteins and have a look. So we did this. And I won't dwell on the top 20 at each age. And the, and the down-regulated top 20, except the red box, there's trim T13, that puts those two O-methyl groups into the tRNA. It's one of the most upregulated proteins in the pathology. Is it modifying these tRNAs? Well, let's go find out. We'll go map this now with some technologies that we have available to us. There's another interesting thing here that I thought was interesting. The three and six months ages have more in common with each other than either do to the nine month. So is the three and six month a gradual increase in the pathology in the nine month is like death and destruction. Things are, are really bad. So you've got the, uh, uh, the two hormones, the pituitary tumor transforming gene and the thyrotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus and the pituitary among the most elevated peptides in three to six months and they're among the most decreased proteins at nine months. So is that saying that there's pathology stress happening at three to six months, but death happening at nine months, where the neurons are simply dying and you're not making any more of that protein? So we don't know. And this is where you're going to have to stay tuned for uh, uh, Andrew's and Weiwei's paper, because that's their proteomics data, very beautiful data set. We're interested in the codon patterns. So here's Tom Bagley's codon counting algorithm. Humans show a, more than 50% of the genome is codon biased. So we applied his algorithm then to the up and down regulated proteins. Bingo, here comes a PCA uh, principal component analysis. These are the scores plots where each dot represents a different protein, 20 down regulated, 20 up regulated. The fact that you can discriminate so cleanly between them tells you that there's very strong codon biases in these up and down regulated proteins. That holds at three months, six months, nine months. Same beautiful distinction between the codons used in the, in the down and the codons used in the up. All right, well, what's going on? Here's the loadings plot. Here are the codons. The green boxes are in the region where the proteins went up. Pink boxes in the regions where the proteins went down. There's even a hoteling circle to tell you with big 95% confidence that there are codons dramatically overused in the upregulated proteins compared to the downregulated proteins. So what? OK, here comes the alternative genetic information. Synonymous pairs differentially enriched in proteins that go down and up to tell you that there's an alternative genetic code used to exp express proteins under the stress of this tauopathy. We now will go through and quantify the tRNAs that are reading all those codons. So we've got some tools now that we've developed. Uh, we mentioned, I mentioned this early on. You've got 20-plus amino acids, uh, but you've got 
420 tRNA genes, 500 in human, about 250 are expressed in humans, 210 roughly in mice. How do you quantify all those? RNA-seq does not work. The reverse transcriptase falls off when you hit a modification. The secondary structures are very tight. The reverse transcriptase falls off. The ligation biases are a thousand fold. So we came up with a new form of next-gen RNA-seq that solves all those problems and in the end makes the read count off the Illumina sequencer directly linearly proportional to the copy number of the RNAs that you want. Why do we want to do that? We want to do that because we want to see what the different levels of each isoacceptor are in one sample. I don't want to have to wait to go from sample to sample to look for change. I want absolute numbers so I can see which of those isoacceptors got modified with MS2I6A or 2-O-methyl-G. Uh, and and in, uh, at, yeast in, uh, at least in um, mycobacteria, there's a 60-fold dynamic range in the number of copies of specific tRNAs, probably bigger in humans. So now we're going to go back, do all this sequencing, and figure out which tRNAs are going up and down in the tau pathology. Do they target those codons in the up and down regulated proteins? Is that model at work in the tauopathy? Same thing, MS2I6A goes up. We're going to go back now and map that. How do we map modifications? We counted the tRNAs with that last one, but they don't work for mapping. So we have got another method that a postdoc just developed. It's the equivalent of TMT proteomics, iTrack proteomics for RNA. He invented a, an isobaric tag for RNA. You fragment all the RNA, put the tags on in each sample, mix them together, put them in the mass spec. You get a... a, a a, a, a breakdown in the collision chamber, just like proteomics, and you read the sequence. And in the end, you know the sequence, therefore you know which RNA it came from. It also tells you the location and quantity of specific chemical modifications because it's exact mass on an orbit trap. So now we can map the modifications and quantify them, and then we get the reporter tag that tells us how much of that tRNA modification are in each sample. And right now, we can cover about 30% of all human tRNA sequences using this. So he's going to apply this now to go back and look at these brain samples to figure out what's going on. This is an example of the kind of information you can get, where ribonuclease T1 cuts all the colored sequences. And look at position 37 in a single tRNA from Pseudomonas. It can have any type of I6A modification, including MS2 I6A. So this now has several modifications that are reprogramming as a function of stress and time, not just the one. It's just wonderfully messy uh, in terms of fun things. We're automating all of this now so that we can do thousands of samples. We just screened the 5,000 gene knockout library in Pseudomonas aeruginosa to look at the effects of each gene on the RNA modifications. Uh, we want to do this with hundreds of tissue samples of cancer, brain disorders. This is the fun one, and I hope I'm not, oh, I'm kind of over my time. I apologize. Um, quick story. Cuisine, wonderful tRNA modification at the wobble position, requires cuine, and that gets swapped in with a transglycosylase to make cuisine, replacing a guanine. Bacteria make cuine, humans don't. Humans must get the cuine from their microbiome or their diet. These iris scientists figured out that you can have a diet with zero cuine in it, believe it or not. So you must then get your cuine from your microbiome. Microbiomes are weird. Who knows? Nobody's ever measured the cuine content from the microbiome. We do know from mouse models that if you create a sterile mouse and short it on cuine in the diet, it develops symptoms of schizophrenia. Huge, big central nervous system uh, disorders. Uh, so there's big studies going on now. We've got a big project to look at the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of cuine in terms of diet and microbiome. And then later on, once we get the toolkit built, we'd love to come back and look at correlations with central nervous system disorders. How does the cuine distribute in the body once it comes from the gut? Are there greedy tissues? Is the brain a greedy tissue that sucks up all the cuine? Or does it get shorted by the time the blood gets up to the brain? so to speak, right? Okay, that's it. Wonderful group of people, collaborators. Greatly appreciate the funding from the Aging Brain Initiative. Thank you.
Thank you. I wonder, I don't know what's happening here, but I wonder whether, how long it will be before you can look at individual brain regions. For example, in a slice, in other words, like slice sheet. So right now, we're able to do, in mice, uh, 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 subsections of the brain, very small, even hypothalamus, that we can get enough RNA and protein out of that to do this. I would love to go to single cell tools to analyze tRNA copy numbers and proteins now and do that on a slice, a section, and map out at that level of resolution, whatever you can get. Uh, 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 we, we're, we're, we're starting to think about how do you practically do RNA-seq at a single cell level to get the tRNA, to get the tRNAs. You're not going to get the modifications out at single cell level unless you have antibodies. You know, yeah, it's a, it's a big breath. I don't know. Proteomics, they can do that now. tRNAs, we can do messenger RNA, single cell. I don't know how well tRNA works, but I think the technology is almost there. So we can get two pieces of that puzzle solved at that point. Look for codon biases once you have the proteomes and the tRNA copy numbers. So I think it's tractable. I may retire before it actually happens, but we'll see. So um, right now, based on your proteomics and your sequencing data, will you be able to make out like um, specific cell types that show changes? In, in this is the problem. TRNA? We've mixed everything together here. Glial cells, everything. Uh, no, we can't tease that out yet. Uh, be fun to work with some uh, with the people who know how to dissect out specific brain regions and specific types. The problem for us is that while you're sitting there working to do the dissections, the, the, everything's reprogramming. It's a stress, it's a new stress. The temperature changes, the oxygen changes, and boom. After 30 minutes, are you actually getting a reliable, high fidelity report of the system, or have you now got what happens when you take chunks of brain out and let it sit for half an hour? That's a big problem. But, you know, snap freeze and work fast, right? Yeah, I'm more curious from your, your PAL model. Do you think the changes primarily happen in the immune cell population or in neurons? Don't know. Don't know. At that nine month age, or is it just an infiltrate of macrophages and neutrophils? Uh, what, what percentage of the population do they make up? It's the 800 pound gorillas we're measuring in that sense, in terms of the ab most abundant cell types. So yes, we've got a, got a gamish here, but some of them are so striking that somewhere there's MS2 I6A going up like, and that's only in tRNA. So somebody's got a problem. Yeah, we're we looking at other organs, not in the in the in the tau, tauopathic mouse model, but there's a human body proteome that we've now found codon biases for each of the different tissues. Hard to get those tissues back from those studies. Uh, two papers, 30 organs. Um, we're going to do this in uh, rats and mice. There's an age model, aging model for rats that we did DNA adducts in there. We're going to go back and repeat this now for tRNA modifications age and organ specific shifts in the whole translatome and uh, epitranscriptome. Funny you should mention that. Could We're, you please repeat it? Oh, uh, are we looking at the appendix and appendicitis? Uh, yes, we are actually with a Spanish group uh, in Barcelona uh, uh, because the inflammation is a self-contained gradient of inflammation. The appendix, the inflamed appendix, is a self-contained gradient of inflammation. Severe at the tip, dropping off to the base to be normal tissue. And they're surgical discards. And so we've got a project going in Barcelona for the surgeons to take these surgical discards, pop them immediately into liquid nitrogen and save them for us. And we're now measuring the modifications in quadrants along the way tRNA, the proteomes, and all this stuff. It's a beautiful internally controlled system to look at the effects of inflammation. And maybe from that, we can dissect out what's inflammation and what's not. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of fun. Hi. So 
so we know the mitochondrial tRNAs, and we can now, through the sequencing part and the mass spec sequencing, go back and quantify them and their modifications. When we extract tRNA from the cell right now, it's just a bucket of slop coming from every subcellular organism. It's a big population. We have done mitochondrial purifications, and we do see different modifications in there. Q becomes galactosyl cuisine, manosyl cuisine, that are differentially located in mitochondria and cytosol. It just gets wildly complicated when you get to that point, but it, we're, we're getting close. Yeah, and, and that may get to the point of like a single cell or a tissue-based analysis with antibodies and sequencing to say, where there's an infiltrate of macrophages, do you get one set of neuronal epitranscriptome reprogramming versus, let's say, uninflamed regions? You know, we might be able to get to that point. Yeah, right now, no. It's a pilot project. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.